That is, without a doubt, the most instantly recognizable piece of music that Charles Gounod ever wrote. It brought its composer a degree of popular success which he grew to find a positive embarrassment, maddened by the praise for something that was not even an original creation, but an improvisation on Bach's prelude in C major, when his loftier, more ambitious works were ignored. He longed to leave his mark with a composition that embraced the human and the divine, that addressed the great questions of good and evil. And he did achieve his ambition, although not till he was over 40, with his opera Faust. This comparatively slow start could perhaps have been due to the fact that, as a young man, he might just as easily have become a painter as a composer. His father, who died when Gounod was four, was an accomplished illustrator and drawing master, and young Charles inherited some of his talent. He was certainly, from an early age, an absolute bundle of contradictions. As a boy, he planned to become a priest, but by the age of 16, he had decided that music was to be his life, and he set his heart on winning the Prix de Rome. A scholarship for study in Italy, this was a much coveted honour and mark of recognition. Other winners included Berlioz, Bizet and Massenet. It was Gounod's turn to win in 1839, and although musically he found little to inspire him in Rome, apart from some exceptional singing by the choir of the Sistine Chapel, he was overwhelmed by the city's artistic riches. He read prodigiously, and made numerous new friends, including Felix and Fanny Mendelssohn. He attended concerts and theatre performances, went on religious retreats whenever he felt he'd been living it up too enthusiastically, suffered a string of possibly psychosomatic illnesses, and composed a requiem and a number of songs. He also took full advantage of being able to travel elsewhere in Italy and beyond, to Trieste, Graz, Vienna and Berlin, and he fell under the spell 
like so many before him and so many after him, of Venice, which he described as a perpetual kaleidoscope, a weird mixture of the most contradictory impressions, a pearl cast into a dark and noisome place, intoxicating but suffused with nameless melancholy. Thank you. 
but Italy could not be his home forever. After three and a half years, in 1843, Gounod returned to Paris and to his mother, a remarkable woman who was up at five o'clock every morning, gave piano lessons all day, and devoted her spare time, such as it was, to charitable works. She had found a job for him to come back to as organist and music director at the Church of Foreign Missions. The salary was on the low side. The organ was inferior and limited in range, and the choir consisted of two basses, a tenor and a boy treble. But for Guno, young, energetic, and with a head full of new musical theories, it was an opportunity to be grasped with enthusiasm. He also embarked on writing his first opera, Sappho, recognizing that religious and symphonic music belong, of course, to a higher order than does music for the theater. But the opportunities and methods of making one's name in them are rare and only reach an occasional audience instead of the regular one that goes to the theater. The theater is a place where every day you have the means and the opportunity of communicating with the public. It is available to the musician as a permanent daily shop window. Sappho, into which Gounod poured all his energies and aspirations, was not the triumph for which he yearned. He was greatly cast down by its indifferent reception, but not altogether discouraged because it had definitely got him noticed. Shortly after its first performance, he encountered his old piano teacher, Pierre Zimmerman, and was introduced to the four Zimmerman daughters, becoming a frequent visitor to their house, charming everyone with his husky singing voice and affectionate nature. He was a great one for hugging and kissing when emotionally excited. A friend once warned, do not be surprised if he kisses you. On the station platform earlier today, he kissed my father, my mother, the children, the school teacher, friends. He was just getting to the station master when the train pulled out of the station. Madame Zimmerman, like Jane Austen's Mrs. Bennet, had an abundance of unmarried girls on her hands and decided that her Anna should become Madame Guno without delay. She took Guno to one side and told him that people were beginning to talk. He must either marry Anna or stop coming to visit. Guno liked Anna well enough, but decided he was not yet sufficiently well established enough to become engaged to her. He wrote a polite and carefully worded letter explaining his decision. When he went to deliver the letter in person, Madame Zimmerman opened the door, embraced him delightedly and said, ah, we were expecting this. Come in and join your betrothed. Gounod was trapped. He gave in, dominated, neither for the first nor the last time by strong-willed women. He and Anna married. They were to produce two children, and found themselves in comfortable circumstances inheriting a spacious country house just outside Paris. So Gounod could escape the city whenever he felt the need for peace and quiet, a place where he could compose, inspired by the fresh air and the open fields. <laughs> Sweet. 
But all that bucolic bliss was to be short-lived. Both international and personal crises were to intervene. In 1870, France became embroiled in war with Prussia. Defeat seemed inevitable. And Gounod decided to take himself and his family somewhere safer. On the 13th of September, he and his wife, children and mother-in-law set sail for England, exchanging the outskirts of Paris for Blackheath on the outskirts of London. It must have been an unsettling time for Gounod, but he was already well known in the English capital, and it wasn't long before he was signed up by a publisher and concert promoter, Henry Littleton of Novellos. Gounod found himself taken up by London society hostesses, rapidly becoming the darling of the drawing rooms. This was a time which Henry James was to describe in The Portrait of a Lady when he wrote that his heroine, Isabel Archer, had everything that a girl could have. Abundant opportunity for dancing, plenty of new dresses, the poetry of Browning, the prose of George Eliot, the music of Gounod. Rising blithely to the challenge, Gounod turned his hand to writing songs to English texts, and he would perform them to his own piano accompaniment singing in that alluringly clouded voice of his and making eyes at the women who gathered around. Saga Poe. 
The response of one particular woman was excessive, even for those days of high Victorian sentiment. At a select musical gathering on the 26th of February, 1871, Georgina Weldon found herself the target of Gounod's ardent glances and was instantly moved to tears. Married but childless, an accomplished singer and the enthusiastic promoter of her own technique of vocal training, she was soon sobbing uncontrollably. Retiring behind a curtain to drink a glass of water and recover, she emerged only when the other guests had gone. She and the composer of the hour struck up an immediate friendship. Georgina was 35 years old, Guno was 54, and they misunderstood each other profoundly from the very start. She was a woman whose voluptuously luscious looks belied a nature that was pent up, passionate, but entirely lacking in sensuality. As a girl, she'd fallen for a young army officer named Harry Weldon and married him despite strenuous parental opposition. She bestowed on him, and later on Guno, precisely the same good-natured, indulgent attention as she did on her collection of pampered pug dogs. Her ambitions for herself and for her husband were considerable. She got Harry out of soldiering, which wasn't leading him anywhere, and into a job in which he took no great interest at the College of Arms. Then she concentrated on her singing career and the development of her Weldon system of vocal training. The system was perhaps surprisingly both simple and practical. She held that clear diction and a sober, unembellished style are essential. A good singer should be able to speak, recite or sing with equally natural grace. Every word that is sung should be said as if in the course of common conversation or as if read. Beyond this, she was convinced that girls trained in her technique from birth would naturally emerge as great singers and to that end became determined to establish her own singing school. She persuaded Harry to take out the lease on a large house in Tavistock Square in Bloomsbury, a house in which Charles Dickens had previously lived and to which he'd added a small theatre, ideal for her purposes. 
Georgina's first pupils turned out not to be as biddable as she had anticipated. They even came equipped with parents who sometimes had the temerity to interfere. She concluded that she should, in future, concentrate on orphans only. As these orphans came with no financial funding attached, and she and Harry were not especially affluent, she would have to raise the money herself to keep them and train them. She therefore gave a series of public concerts, and it was in the course of selecting works to perform that she first came across the music of Guno and was entranced. It spoke to her, she wrote enthusiastically, of violets, periwinkles, foxgloves, tangled ferns waving in picturesque disorder by the side of a purling brook, indeed, of a time of roses. <laughs> A few days after their first encounter, Guno dropped by St. James's Hall, where Georgina was rehearsing, and heard her singing Mendelssohn's Hear My Prayer. He was struck by the pure, unadorned quality of her voice, which he memorably described as a voice of two sexes. The day after that, she called on him at home to volunteer herself to sing at a charity concert for the benefit of the French war wounded. They sat down at the piano, and sang through the entire score of Faust together. According to Georgina, everyone was overcome, including Anna Guno and her mother. There were more tears from both parties, and Guno declared that here was the only woman worthy of performing as the heroine of his next opera, the work that would out Faust Faust, a composition with which his name would be forever associated, an iconic title for all time, intended by its composer to express the unknown and irresistible powers that Christianity has spread among humanity. Polyucht. The floodgates were open. Georgina and Guno plunged into heady flirtation. She was enthralled to his genius, hailing him as the messiah of the gospel of new music while he was flattered by her devotion and impressed by what he perceived to be her practical business skills. 
She addressed him as divine being. He called her Mousy and Cher Mimi. She was pliant and adoring where his wife was penny-pinching and censorious. They flaunted their affections quite openly and began to provoke considerable gossip. If a heart-sleeping maiden awake, awake, and open thy door, tis the break of day, and we must away for meadow and mount and moor. Tis the break of day, and we must away for meadow and mount and moor. Wait not to find thy slippers, but come, come with thy naked feet. We shall have to pass through the dewy grass and waters wide and fleet. We shall have to pass through the dewy grass and waters wide and fleet. Come, come with thy naked feet. Come, come with thy naked feet. Come, come, come. Naked feet. In France, the situation was increasingly grim, with Paris under siege by the Prussians, and Gounod wrote a patriotic cantata, Gallia, which he described as a representation of the invincible spirit of his beleaguered homeland. It was performed in the newly built Royal Albert Hall in May 1871 to wild applause from an audience of 10,000 people. A fortnight after this triumph, Gounod and Anna had one of their frequent violent arguments. But this time, when Gounod stormed out of the house, he had somewhere to go. He turned up at Tavistock House, wept on the bosoms of both Weldons, swore that his marriage was over, and declared that he could no longer bear to live with someone who so failed to understand and nurture his artistic temperament. Anna had had enough. She left with the children and her mother for an uncertain future in France. Gounod, clutching the unfinished score of Polyucht, and accompanied by quantities of baggage, moved into Tavistock House. His trunk was held together by a rope, which he told Georgina was the scourge with which he flagellated himself while at prayer. All Georgina's thwarted maternal instincts came to the fore. Gounod complained that Anna had ruined his digestion, so she put him on a rigorous diet. Her medical advisor diagnosed eczema, glandular swelling, congestion of the lungs, and a potential cerebral attack. He prescribed a treatment to make the wretched patient sweat, thereby releasing injurious toxins. Georgina swaddled her large, bearded baby in wet sheets, blankets, and furs. She gave him hot baths, soaping him down and scrubbing his back vigorously, combed his still luxuriant long hair, and served him tempting little meals. When Harry, who viewed all of this with remarkable tolerance, came home at the end of the day, he would shout as he opened the front door, Has the old man perspired yet? Georgina was ecstatic. She was a muse, a mother figure, and an inspiration to her resident composer, who prized, as she considered her due, both her singing abilities and her interpretation of his music. When he was well enough, Guno would play the piano and she would sing his very own nightingale.
This state of mutual adoration could not possibly last. The Goon Odyssey, as it came to be known, headed for the rocks almost immediately. Tavistock House was packed to the rafters with singing pupils and yapping dogs, and Guno soon began to feel more of a prisoner than a cherished guest. Georgina had become possessive and domineering, and a year after he'd first moved in, matters came to a climax in a dramatic quarrel. Guno staggered from his sickbed and threatened to leave the house. Georgina ignored him. Guno waited for Harry to come home before running out into the night. Harry wrestled him back indoors, prizing him off the railings to which he was clinging. Guno rushed to his desk, where he kept his score of polyuked, and threatened to throw it on the fire. Georgina, According to her luridly colourful memoirs, knocked him down, rolled on him. We tussled violently for possession of the treasure. I tore it from him. I sat on it and screamed, You shall kill me first, but you shall not burn Polyuct. It sounds as if Guno and Georgina thoroughly enjoyed themselves, but the same could not be said for Harry. He was tired of his wife had a mistress, Annie Lowe, who he wished to marry, and was quietly collecting evidence that might help him obtain a divorce. For the time being, however, the storm had blown over, and life settled down again to what passed as normal. Georgina inaugurated a series of Sunday at-homes to show off her illustrious guest to curious visitors, and together they embarked on planning a series of concerts at the Royal Albert Hall to take place in the spring of 1872. They swiftly ran into trouble. The Times published an article deploring the absence of works by any English composer. Tickets failed to sell in sufficient numbers, and Guno threatened to resign from the project. He and Georgina wrote such vitriolic letters to Novellos that in the autumn of 1872, the publisher sued for libel. The matter duly came to court, where Georgina found herself in her element. She reduced both judge and jury to helpless laughter and, in her opinion, exposed the entire legal profession as incompetent. Guno lost the case and was required to pay costs, while the damages awarded to Novello were a token 40 shillings. In France, the general opinion seemed to be that Guno had been beguiled, bewitched and bewildered. The Paris newspaper was scandalised. Was there ever a more singular history than that of Gounod and the Englishwoman? Since Delilah, 
who cut off Samson's hair. There has never been anything so curious. At her feet, he forgets all, family and country. Passion, the newspaper concluded, has taken possession of the artist's brain and driven from it the remembrance of all that is decent. Back at Tavistock House, Gounod settled down to compose a stage work based on the life of Joan of Arc. Every now and again, the prevailing chaos drove him to an outburst of rage when he would threaten to shoot himself or go back to his wife and family in France. His greatest fury was reserved for the dogs. You cannot live without your pugs, he taunted. Georgina, as ever, appeared to thrive on the excitement, but Harry Weldon and Gounod were both exhausted. In the spring of 1874, Gounod had a series of fainting fits and took to wandering about the corridors in the middle of the night, half asleep and uttering unearthly cries. Harry sank into a depression, and Georgina decided to send them both off to Hastings for sea air and convalescence. They walked along the seafront together. Guno bestowed on Harry the fond nickname of Pumps and attempted to raise his spirits by kissing and embracing him at every opportunity. Harry wrote to his wife, When the old man takes me in his arms to comfort me, I don't know what I would not do to him. I'd as soon be kissed by a viper. Nonetheless, this period of relative tranquility that suited Gounod and all the players in this story rather well. Gounod had been much affected by accounts of the death of the doctor and missionary David Livingstone in Africa and wrote a musical setting of a stirring poem on this subject, which he dedicated to Georgina. Speedings, heart 
All this time, on the other side of the channel, Anna Guno was patiently waiting, determined to get her husband back. Now she sensed that his defences were down and enlisted the help of a Dr. Blanche, in whose clinic Guno had recovered from earlier nervous episodes. It was hardly to be expected that the Goon Odyssey would reach its conclusion without a final element of farce. On his return from Hastings, Guno accepted an invitation to visit a Mrs. Louisa Brown in Blackheath, a friend made when he'd first arrived in England. Georgina drove him there, accompanied by two of the despised pugs. As they arrived, her favourite, Mr. Whittles, had a fit and began to froth at the mouth. She ran to get some water for him, and in the meantime, a crowd of curious onlookers gathered around her carriage. There were cries of, mad dog, and Guno's embarrassment and irritation was so intense that he had to be carried into Mrs. Brown's house in a state of collapse. It was agreed he should stay the night there in order to recover, and Georgina drove home to Tavistock Square without him. It was the beginning of the end. A telegram came from Blackheath to say that Guno was ill and wandering in his mind. Harry and Georgina hurried over to visit the invalid. Georgina lay down on the bed beside him, but Guno pretended to be asleep, flat on his back, with a silver crucifix on his chest. Dr. Blanche diagnosed a form of brain fever and insisted that he must be returned to his family. Guno, wearing a battered old Panama hat, once given to him by Harry, was driven to Charing Cross Station, where, weeping copiously, he was escorted onto the boat train. Georgina, distraught but fiercely dry-eyed, waved goodbye from the platform. She probably knew she was unlikely ever to see him again.
Needless to say, the drama was by no means over. Gounod had left most of his belongings at Tavistock House, including the only copy of the still unfinished score of Polyucht. He sent letters from Paris asking Georgina to parcel up his things and send them on to him. She refused, demanding that he should first recompense her financially for the losses she'd made by supporting him for so long. Eventually provoked beyond endurance, Gounod wrote, My dear Mimi, I can no longer hide from you the profound and bitter grief which your letters have caused me. I have lived three years beside you, in your hands, under your guardianship. You have been witness to what I have expended in strength, anguish, suffering of all kinds. France is essentially the country of precision, neatness and taste. That is to say, the opposite of excess, pretentiousness, disproportion and long-windedness. Since you have desired my peace and tranquility, do not dream of reopening for me an existence which cannot bring us peace. May God keep you, your dear old man who kisses you, Shalguno. P.S. Please send me your bill. The request for her bill was a serious error of judgment. In her memoirs, Georgina's list of what would be covered by such a bill ran to 16 pages. I had been his sick nurse. I had been his secretary. I'd done the round of publishers for him. I'd written all sorts of puffs and advertisements for him. I'd spent my money. I'd sung at all his concerts. I'd always sung his compositions. I had played the devil so that he might appear an angel. I had been the rat to his lion. I had been the monkey among the crocodiles. Once she had enumerated expenses that included his board and lodging for three years and calculated the interest that had accrued, she let the dear old man know that the total amount owed to her was an eye-watering £9,087, five shillings and ninepence, not far off a million pounds in today's money. He was quite unable to pay. She, having acquired a taste for litigation, took the fight to the law courts, where it dragged on for years. For Guno, the English episode, which had become so painfully distressing and for which he'd been derided in his home country, was something to be dismissed and forgotten as quickly as possible. He became reconciled with Anna and sank gratefully back into family life. He composed quantities of religious music and more operas, none of which attained the success of his earlier works, on which his considerable reputation now rested. Somewhat prematurely, he took on the status of the grand old man of French music, often receiving visitors, while seated at the organ he had had installed in his study, bathed in the lights from stained glass windows depicting sacred subjects, a black velvet cap perched on his now snowy white hair. He lived for another 20 years, dying peacefully at home in 1893.
The events which filled the remainder of Georgina's life were rather more dramatic. Her marriage to Harry came apart, and relations between them deteriorated to such an extent that he attempted to have her confined to a lunatic asylum. She took him to court and won, becoming in the process of preparing her case a formidable campaigner for the reform of lunacy laws. Her attempts to sue Guno, her husband, various doctors and assorted music publishers for libel, always acting as her own legal counsel, earned her the nickname the Portia of the Law Courts, but was so costly that she raised money by letting her image appear on advertisements for Pear's Soap that were plastered on the side of every London omnibus. Her own libelous actions resulted in two prison sentences, which she greatly enjoyed, keeping her prison clothes and wearing them in public while giving concerts and delivering stirring speeches on judicial reform. She took the handful of remaining orphans from Tavistock House to a convent in Normandy, where she wrote eight volumes of unreliable memoirs and became an enthusiastic gardener. She invented a device for watering fruit trees with liquid manure, taught herself braille, became keenly interested in spiritualism, and claimed to have made contact with Guno shortly after his death. Under the name of Granny Weldon, she wrote and published music for children, including Song for a Sparrow and Pussy's Christmas Song. She died in Brighton in 1914, just before the outbreak of the First World War. Harry, free at last, married his mistress Annie Lowe later the same year. Georgina and Guno spent three tempestuous years in each other's company. Their friendship came horribly to grief, and they not only failed to understand each other, but also had scant understanding of their own characters, foibles and failings. Georgina never forgot and never quite forgave. As usual, she had the last word. Towards the end of her life, she wrote in her diary, Old man gone and I fast going, his music is thought nothing of now. All the same, the sanctimonious old patriarch had once been a young man, ardent and loving, and the flamboyantly opinionated litigant was once an impressionable, passionate girl. To his dying day, Guno never forgot the sound of her beguiling singing voice and the music dismissed by Georgina, survived them both.
Je ne veux pas le savoir, et ce 